Salutations to the Truth Corps, whoever and wherever you may be on the planet. This is once again John Lash, the Gnostic Smartass, with the sixth installment in Mythology 101. And the title of this episode is The Hebrew File. So in the last talk, I introduced, formally introduced to you, a tool of forensic research in mythology, comparative mythology, which I had already been using and applying. But I defined exactly what that tool is and how it works and how to use it. I can happily assure you, bear with me, I'm in a rare mood today, that you can stand with any professor in the field of mythology and run circles around them using the tool of the mythogen. So what you're getting in this course is actually instruction at the graduate or even postgraduate level of what you would receive in a university. Now what we're going to do in this talk together is really bear down on this material with intense scrutiny. Now remember that I read the table of contents of the volume on Semitic mythology from the mythology of all races. And I noted that it did not dedicate a specific chapter to Hebrew biblical mythology. So technically, Hebrew biblical mythology, the Old Testament, and by extension, the New Testament, and the book of Revelation all derive out of Judaism. It's all the same program. So, oh, by the way, I'm going to turn off the furnace. Somehow it seems this podcast mic is picking up that sound, which is just in the other room. So, what's life? without a few prosaic details now and then. To continue, I invite you to stand with me in front of the large table. Remember what we did. We started out with 40 files and two set aside. Now we have those two files immediately in front of us. And we have the 40 files in a stack, hoping it doesn't fall over and kill us or at least knock us into a coma. Consistent with my new style of delivery, I'll tell you the takeaway of this talk. We're going to discern and distinguish in close detail the elements in this particular ethnic version of Semitic mythology, that is to say, the founding myth of the ancient Hebrews. We're going to distinguish and discern those elements in it which characterize it in a unique way and set it apart from all other mythological narratives. To do that, let's begin by putting the right designation on the cover of the file. So the comprehensive title of the file is Semitic Mythology. But more specifically, it is Hebrew Biblical Mythology. So it is race-specific And it is also language specific. But let's 
look closely at that distinction. As I've said, I think I've said, this particular mythogen and the agenda it carries of racial supremacy comes into the world through the Semitic languages, which are Arabic, Hebrew, and Aramaic. And that is a very great fact. Scholars dispute the issue, but they're generally agreed that the historical figure of Jesus, if you can accept it was an historical figure, he was, was spoke probably Hebrew, Greek, and Aramaic. And there are some people that claim that if you don't read the Aramaic translation, say, of the sayings of Jesus, you don't really know what he said. So as we take this file of the two files in front of us on the table, under close scrutiny, it helps to be really precise in labeling it correctly. And it has to be labeled in two ways. According to its linguistic origin, the Semitic languages, and according to its racial origin. So you know already, and this is quite something when you know it, that Semitic is a language designation and not a racial designation. There was once a man called Ernst Zundel, and he made this comment, well, anti-Semitism wouldn't exist if Semitism didn't exist. So what is Semitism? Well, Semitism literally cannot be associated with any particular race because it's a language distinction, which, however, happens to be the language of particular races. But you see the difference. There is a difference. So the correct linguistic designation of this file is Semitic. But what is the precise racial designation of this file? Let's look more closely at that. There's been a lot of discussion, and there is, of course, a lot of controversy about the designation of the various races of the human species. Now, if you follow my jargon, you know that I speak clearly and distinctly about that issue. I say that there is only one species, the anthropine species, but there are various races within that species. And there are various ethnicities within those races. So you have species, race, and ethnicity. One way to look at the very, very big question of racial identities racial derivatives of the human species is to just hold up your hand. Hold up your hand with the palm facing you and look at the five fingers, four fingers and the thumb. Those are the five races. Did you know that there were five races and not three? Generally, we hear about the Caucasoid race totality of the white peoples, including the white European and Euro-American peoples, and the white peoples in the Southern Hemisphere, in Australia and New Zealand. Then you hear of the Negroid races, which are massively preponderant on the planet, and the Mongoloid or Chinese races, which are also massively preponderant. So as it stands today, the white Asian Caucasian Caucasian race 
is the minority on the planet, and it's an endangered minority. It's somewhere between 12 and 8% of the global population. So when you look at your hand, you see five appendages, and those are the five races. So what are the other two? Well, there was a German scholar, once again the Germans, named Blumenbach, I believe. I'll put a reference in the page on Nemeta for Mythology 101. And it was this gentleman who initially defined these races. But he didn't just define three of them. He defined five of them. Okay? So when you see your hand, you're looking at five races. So what are the other two? Well, he designated one of them as the race of the Native American Indians. And I totally concur. I do not consider that the race of the Native American Indians of North America, let's just say Canada and North America for the moment, were derived or descended from Mongoloids who crossed the Bering Straits when there was a land bridge between Siberia and Africa. That is one of the pro, uh, prominent theories. I do not accept that that is the origin of the red race of the Native American peoples. They occupy their own distinct racial group. So that's four, Caucasian, Mongolian, Negroid, Native American, or Red Peoples. And what's the fifth? Well, the fifth is the most unknown of all. But in a way, it's more important than any of the others in the investigation that we're making here. What actually is the race that spoke the Semitic languages. Semitic is not a race. So, as Ernst Zundel said, uh, we wouldn't have anti-Semitism if we didn't have Semitism. Well, what is Semitism? It's the ideology that comes through the Semitic languages. But specifically, what race does it come through? We have to designate both of these factors to label this file correctly. So here's the scoop. What came through in the Semitic languages came from the Armenoid races. Armenoid. A-R-M-E-N-O-I-D. That is a designation for a particular strain of the human species that came out of the area of China or the Far East, but standing distinct from the Mongolian Chinese peoples. The Armenoid race is the root of what are called Arabic peoples. Now, some people claim that Arabs, which is a cultural designation rather than a racial designation, strictly speaking, but some people claim that Arabs are cousins, as it were, to the Aryan-Caucasian race. But they're not. They are a distinct race, which can be characterized as a kind of melange, mix of Turkish, Asiatic, and Arabian elements. And into the Arabian side of it come the African elements. And so there is a certain admixture or commingling between the Armenoid race and the Negroid races of Africa, North Africa, and that produces a range of racial types 
such as the Bedouin. That's an ethnicity. The Bedouin are desert tribes of Arabia, right? Well, so were those who produced the biblical narrative, the mythogen of the Jewish people. They are a specific ethnic strain of the Armenoid races. And in fact, what you see when you step back and look at that full picture is that the people who are called Jews today and those who are called Arabs are actually of the same race. They are cousins of the same race. But hey, hold on a minute. Even the biblical myth says that, doesn't it? It says that the progeny of Abraham was the patriarch of the chosen people went out to the world through two lines through his wife Sarah they propagated the line of the Jewish people but through his concubine Hagar Abraham had a son called Ishmael and that is the line of the Arabic peoples. So the Arabs are in fact, as they live today, in Palestine and elsewhere, are half brothers and half sisters to the Jewish people. And even the record of the Old Testament asserts that fact. Given all that, we can finally put the precise label on this file, which is on the left hand, with the file of the Sophianic Gnostic material, which is race specific to the Aryans and the Iranians on the right hand. What is the precise label? Well, it begs the question, what is the difference between the, what a people call themselves and what they are called by others? Get that? So let's look at what the ethnic strain of the ancient Hebrews called themselves. And then looks, let's look at what they were called by others. They called themselves Yehudin, the Yehudi people. That's what they called themselves. And in a second, we're going to take a really close look at what's in that name. What's in a name? Sometimes what's in a name tells the whole story. But they were not called that by the other ethnic tribes of Armenoids or by the Aryan Caucasian peoples, such as the ancient Iranians who are the pure Aryan stock who gave us the Sophianic vision story. No, these people, the Yehudans, were called Hebrew. And Hebrew means, so it is said, on the authority of such comparative mythologists as Merche Eliade, a donkey herder, or someone who is dirty, an itinerant, someone who carries vermin. That's what Hebrew means. Maybe. It certainly carried that connotation in ancient times, as far as I can tell, from looking into the primary sources, as far as I've been able to do. But there is another, even more telling translation of the word Hebrew. It may come from a Sumerian root that means someone who crosses a boundary, an intruder, or someone who does not respect boundaries, an intruder. So encoded into this word, Ibaru, is not only an obvious insult and an expression of dislike and disgust, that's just a fact. I'm not making this up and I'm not intending to
to slur anybody. I'm just reporting the facts. Just the facts, ma'am. And at the same time, the deeper meaning, which I consider to be more significant, or equally as significant, is that these people were considered to be intruders wherever they went. They were intruders. And they violated the boundaries of other ethnic groups. So I'm going to designate this file as the Hebrew file. Bearing in mind, of course, that if I took the prerogative coming from the people themselves, it would be called the Yehudi file. Now let's look at that word Yehudi. That is the name, the self-identification given to the people who produced the Hebrew biblical narrative. And remember that the mythogen contains two elements. One is the identity of the people and the other is their mandate or mission. Now I tend to take the view that it's considerate to say the least, to always inquire what people of a certain ethnicity or nation or region call themselves by contrast to what others call them. Primary example of that is the Welsh. You know, the word Welsh is an Anglo-Saxon term that means an odd person or a weird person. Welsh is weird. So when the Anglo-Saxon invaders got to England and they penetrated into the depths of that beautiful country of Wales, they found the indigenous natives, the Welsh, to be weird. And so they called them weird. But what did the Welsh call themselves? Well, they call themselves the same thing to this day, the Cymru. So you see, it's really important as a matter of respect and accuracy to know the names by which people designate themselves. Fair enough, isn't it? I designate myself as an Aryan. I come from the Aryan root stock of the Aryan Caucasian races. Even though I'm an Italian-Irish hybrid, which is a very late propagation of the species, I still look back to my ancestral roots and I consider myself to be Aryan. And Aryan means noble or excellent. So what does Yehudi mean? It so happens that that term, which is a current term, by the way, contains three key letters from the Hebrew alphabet. Yod, Hey, and Vol. Y, H, V, or U. The V and U are interchangeable. So look at the word Yehudi and see the three consonants. Y, H, and vow, vo, which is a V or U. Well, isn't that remarkable? Gee whiz, I wonder what that means. I wonder what that shows, what it reveals. Well, it reveals that the name of the supreme creator God of the ancient Hebrews, Yahweh, pronounced in four syllables, Yahweh Vohe, the name of the deity of those people is encoded in their own name. Does that give you just an inkling or a hint of what they think of themselves? Now, remember the formula of the mythogen. It's quite simple. It states the identity of the people how they see themselves, and it states 
their purpose, what they consider to be their mission or their role. So obviously, in the identity of the Hebrew, the ancient Hebrews, there is a God complex. They have a God complex. They do not merely consider themselves to be the chosen ones of their ethnic or tribal deity, Yod, He, Vau, He, but they in some manner consider themselves to be the embodiment of that deity. And this is essential to their mythogen. So as such, they are by definition a deific race. So now we have the label. <laughs> that is some label. I think you would agree. Now we have the label for the file. And you see the implications in the label are already pretty, pretty enormous. Now we're going to look, in concluding this talk, at the particulars of the file. So let's open the file. Now if I get around to it, and I don't have too many prosaic distractions, I will actually list as a bullet list in the notes for Mythology 101 what I'm going to tell you now. So who are the actors in the mythic narrative of the Hebrew or Yehudi? First of all, there is the supreme deity, El or Elian. And I would have you note something. The name of that deity is not stated in Genesis. It doesn't say Elian created heaven and earth. It just says he did. So the name is concealed. And there's a reason for that because there's a long standing tradition among the Hebrews which is maintained by the Talmudic rabbis who guide them, that you're not supposed to say the name Yod, He, Vo, He. And so rather than pronounce the name of God, a sacred name, they say Hashem, which means the name, without naming the name, without naming the identity behind the name. But that identity is the first item in the bullet list. And then Elion, which sounds like alien, doesn't it? Produces the Elohim. And then the Elohim produce Adam. And then somewhere Eve appears out of the rib of Adam. And Adam and Eve are the original parents of what? Well, if you're brought up in the Judeo-Christian tradition, in the Christianized nations of the world, such as the nations of Europe or in the United States of America, you are taught that Adam and Eve are your parents. So you are told, erroneously, that this race-specific mythology is also race-generic. But it is not. It's not race-generic. Because actually, Adam and Eve are designations in mythological language that refer first to the Jewish people, they are Adam, and secondly to Eve, and that is their land, Israel. And that is the basis of their mythology, and any Talmudic rabbi would confirm that, I believe. Anyone who dared to speak the truth. So, to continue, I'll wrap up as quickly as possible the remaining items in the bullet list. Well, after Adam and Eve, we come to Abraham, the patriarch of the three Abrahamic religions. And there is an incident that happens where 
someone comes to Abraham when he is in a drowsed and semi-comatose state, sleeping against a tree in the grove of Mamre. This is all in, the, in Genesis. I'm not making this up. In fact, there are two accounts of it. And that entity is Melchizedek, who is without generation, having neither father nor mother. Melchizedek, who is accompanied by two figures, angelic figures so-called, on the right and left, consecrates Abraham with the mission of the Yehudin. So the roll call, the cast of characters, continues from that point on. After the promise has been made to Abraham by Melchizedek, Abraham proceeds to propagate his kind. And so you read in the Old, in the Old Testament all of these sequences of generations called begats. So-and-so begat so-and-so and begat so-and-so. So you know, of course, Abraham begat Isaac, this is another bullet point, and connected with Isaac is an extremely important event in the history of the Hebrews, which is the sacrifice. So the Supreme Lord, Elion, or Yahweh, wanted proof of Abraham's complete obedience to his off-planet authority. And so he demanded the sacrifice of his son, Isaac. So then it goes down, further on, to other characters that descend from Abraham. And as I pointed out earlier, there are two branches. The descendants through the mother, Sarah, who are legitimately the Jewish people, still persisting today and attaching themselves to that genealogical identity. And then, on the other hand, there are all of the Ishmaelites, the Arabic peoples, who are half-brothers and half-sisters to the Jews and very often can only be distinguished from them by their headgear, a rag or a beanie. Excuse me. Not meaning to be disrespectful. Who am I to be disrespectful? a towel, and a beanie. So those are the main characters and the main events that you'll find in the bullet list that goes with this talk. So I'm concluding it now, but I do need to mention one thing that I sort of left out. In the descent from Adam and Eve, there is a very strange character Adam and Eve, Cain and Abel. It goes on down the line, right? All the way to Noah. Then you have the flood. Then after the flood, you have Abraham. You have Lot and all those characters. And they are all of the Yehudan ethnicity. This is not a story about the entire human race. It's a story about an extremely minute strain of the Armenoid races. However, it's important to note, previous to Abraham, previous to the flood, that the book of Genesis describes other characters, and these do play in the background of the mythogen we're investigating here. So Adam and Eve were the primal parents, presumably, of humanity at large. That's what you've been led to believe. But that is not the case. There is deceit written all through this narrative. Deceit and obfuscation and concealment. So, following Adam and Eve, there were Cain and Abel, right? And Cain slew Abel, right? And Cain then went out into the east of Eden and married up and paired up with who? Well, there were other tribes, obviously, 
in the Middle East. And so Cain, one of the progenitors of the Yehudi, married exogamously. That's the term. Exogamous means to marry out of your racial strain. Endogamous means to marry within the strain. So Cain goes off, and there must have been other people living in the world who survived the flood because he marries those alien peoples. He marries into them. He propagates with them. So you have the race of Cain. But there's a third entity. And I do believe, I'll check on this, that the name of this entity only occurs once in the Old Testament. You see, it's said that Adam and Eve had a son called Seth. And Seth represents, in some obscure way, a race apart. Seth, in some way, associates to a completely different narrative that stands apart from biblical legend coming from the Hebrews. So put that aside for the moment. Let's just look at the cast of characters and the main events in the mythogen of the Hebrew file. And what we're going to do next is we're going to examine comparatively what is absolutely unique in that narrative. In other words, I'm going to reach up at the tall file of 40 folders and I'm going to pick out some folders from there, say three or four, I'm going to open them up and I'm going to say, look at this. Can you compare the characters and events in the mythic narrative of the ancient Hebrews with any of these other race-specific mythologies around the world? How do you like that question for breakfast? And that's where we go next. And so I welcome you to hang on for the next episode. Enough said, and I'll be seeing you in the beauty to come. <laughs>